Good morning, beloved. If you will, turn in your copy of Scripture to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Ephesians. Got to figure out the sound of the fans for a moment. <laughs> in all seriousness, like, it is good to be able to smile and be grateful that this used to be a pretty regular thing when we were across the street. So... All right. Uh, well, while you're turning to Ephesians 5, if you have not found it yet, I um, invite you into uh, coming up on 13 years ago in my life as I was engaged to my wife, and it was our wedding day. And on our wedding day, uh, my desire for a wedding was simple, small, just not a lot of attention at an event where everyone's attention is on you, and that's just not me. Um, but as any of you in a relationship knows that often your desire doesn't match the desire of your spouse, and that was surely our case. So our wedding was a lot more elaborate than what I would have preferred. Um, but leading up to that, you know, the, the, the whole like bridezilla idea, I'm not at all saying my wife was bridezilla, um, but there's, there's just, you know, there's always some kind of drama because there's so much put on this one day, everything building up to it, that it's so easy anytime something goes sideways or isn't what you want it to be, to just get really frustrated about that. And it's not in correlation to reality, but just tensions are heightened, emotions are running, all the stuff. So um, we're getting to the wedding day, and I had uh, my best friend, uh, he was going to pick me up. And so we're in his old Toyota Tacoma. I love the truck, but we both knew that thing broke down quite a bit. But here we are. We're going to ride in that to get there. And I've already been told that I'm supposed to be there two hours before the ceremony. I'm just thinking, that is so ridiculous. Like, why, why do we need to be at this place that early? And lo, lo and behold, the ladies have been there all day long. I'm like, that's really crazy. But uh, we'll get there and we'll have plenty of time and all this stuff. But I know my strict orders are no later than two hours before the ceremony. I'm supposed to arrive. There's going to be a room, get dressed and all that stuff. They'll take pictures and all this stuff. So we get there. The truck doesn't break down. And I think this is going great. But mind you, we had to go south on the turnpike. And there's definitely this part of my mind's like, we could just keep going. And we go to my happy place. Like, just keep going south. And we'll eventually get the ocean. Like, this will be good. This will be okay. I really want to do this. Nope, we're going to go there. So we make it there. Um, I also, in giving the, the groomsmen their gifts, I had kind of secretly hidden coordinates in their gifts. Um, these were the coordinates where if they found them and I went missing, that's where they would find me. Um, it also was south on an island. Um, but I am here, I am at the wedding venue because I really do love my wife and I wanted to do that. I just didn't want that day. I didn't want that experience of the wedding. But I'm telling myself, it's going to mean a lot to her. This is laying down your life for your bride. Okay, Jesus, I'll do this. So I'm there. I show up. Again, like I already know the tensions, like I know what I'm stepping into. I get to the room that is designated to be mine. The door opens and one of my, one of my bride's bridesmaids is there. And this is an individual who is just kind of a little abrasive. But she throws the door open and starts yelling, Kevin, where have you been? And I lost it. I'm usually a very calm, collected person. I said something that I'm not going to repeat right now. I just blurted it out and simply walked by her and then realized there's a room full of people on the other side of that door that all just witnessed that. And I was like, oh, that's shame on you, Kevin. So I walk in, this guy follows me that I don't know and he has a video camera and he's just going to town and he hands me this microphone pack and he's like, you need to put this on and all this stuff. And I was like, first off, I'm getting dressed right now and you're following me with a video camera. This is weird. And second off, I'm not gonna wear your microphone. And the guy looks at me and he's like, it's not an option. Put the microphone on. I was like, I can promise you it's an option. And I'm not going to take that option. And so he's like, well, I'm going to have to go talk to whoever is paying the bill. And I was like, you can talk to whoever you want to. I'm not putting that microphone on. So he left. He was not happy with me. Um, if you ever see our wedding video, um, it's kind of entertaining. I have not watched the entirety of it. But the guy, basically out of spite for my refusal to put the microphone on, did some interesting things. Um, but anyway, that was my wedding day. But I knew, like, you got to do this. You got to do this. Um, and, and it was lovely. I, I'm so thankful that I gripped my teeth and bore it out. Like, I know it meant a lot to my wife. Um, man, but you have the question, like, why am I doing this? What is the point? And maybe, maybe sometimes, if we're honest, we come to that question in marriage. 
that it's even past the wedding day and all the stress of that. But then in marriage, like, why am I doing this? This is hard. What is the point of this? If you're anything like me, like, I'll just confess to you, there is nothing in this world that can affect me as much as my wife. Like, if things are not good with my wife, then I'm just altogether not good. And so the the part of me that's just like, why would you put yourself in such a weak position, Kevin? (laughs) Like, what is the point of this? What is the meaning of this? Why would I do this? Why do we get married? And that's the question that we need to answer today as we continue Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, Remember, he has unpacked the gospel, this beautiful salvation gospel, good news that you are saved by grace through faith. Nothing you could do. God does it for you. He gives you salvation through the provision of his son, God the son, Jesus Christ, who came, was born a man, and so simultaneously fully God and fully man in this one person. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There's called the hypostatic union. There's this brilliant tension of he is fully God and fully man. As he walks this earth, he actually experiences life as we do. And yet he does it without sin. He never once falls into sin. And so this sinless, fully God, fully man, then dies this death on a cross the only truly innocent one to ever have been slain. He is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that would be offered on our behalf because he took our place on the cross. He died the death you and I deserve and then he rose again victorious over sin and death. And so that was the payment of our sin. The penalty for our sin has been paid in full. The record of debt that stood against us was nailed to the cross. Jesus was nailed to the cross. And so we don't have to face the wrath of God. We are no longer under condemnation. We are saved by grace through faith and what he has done for us. And so what do we do for this salvation? To have eternal life, to be brought back into a meaningful relationship with God as we were created for? We simply believe. We believe in him. We trust that he is the Lord. We confess him to be Lord. We turn from our sin because he has called us to turn from our sin. And if he is Lord, we will obey him. So we turn from our sin, turning to him, our savior, trusting him to save us from our sin. And now by his power, his spirit, He will lead us into freedom. But we're trusting him for that. But because this gospel is of grace, he says, it's not anything that you do to earn this, but you absolutely do something in response to it. So as he progresses through the letter, he says, now in light of that salvation, here's how you should live. And so we're in that portion. We've talked about many things at this point, but now he's going to start going through kind of this different strata of society, different people groups. And so today we start with husbands and wives. We start with marriage as an institution. What is the point of this is the question we need to take into this as he's telling us, here's how husbands and wives ought to interact, ought to behave and all this stuff in light of the gospel. And let's see why marriage even exists. So start with verse 22 with me. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Wow. Did you hear that? Wives, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And I want you to track with me. I know it's hot. We're going to try to keep this brief. But it's really important that you stick with me. Culturally, there is so much bound up in that as a tension. There's so much of that that just rubs us the wrong way. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Do we like that? Do we see beauty in that culturally in this moment? Largely, no. Largely, that seems abrasive. You're telling me that wives are supposed to submit submit to their husbands as to the Lord. That seems crazy. And this has absolutely been so abused. For a long time, this has been abused. It's been used as a biblical citation for why wives should just do anything that a husband says. And it's like, husband is the king and wife is to just do anything and everything he says. That's not what it is saying. Wives, submit to your husbands. Does say, wives, submit to your husbands, though. And so we need to understand what this is saying. And it says to do that, we need to first understand this does not mean that women are less than equal to men. You can have a functional subordination in a relationship and still be equal. Just because someone is under the authority of someone else, is in submission to someone else, does not mean they're of less value. So we need to first see that, and then let's back up, actually. Remember, context helps so much. Look back at verse 21, where we ended last week. What is that command, that last part of it? Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. 
Who is that addressing? All believers submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And so that would have included husbands and wives submitting to one another. There's this mutual submission that goes all around. And yet now he steps further and he says, now look, in this relationship, there's going to be this, this authority structure to where wives, you will submit to your husbands. But that's in the context of mutual submission all around. As we have to see that, this is not just license for men to say, you're going to do it my way. You're going to get whatever I want. You're just, you're my puppet to do whatever I please. No. It's, remember, in the context, it's all submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. In the fear of Christ means anything that that husband now in the authority he has as husband with a wife submitting to him should still be in the fear of Christ. And so we've got to take those together. And as we move through this, we see the command for mutual submission continuing. But within that, there is this delineation of authority. So who is this addressing? Wives. That's also important to note here. This does not say all women submit to all men. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. All my single ladies, you're supposed to throw your hand up? No? There we go. Listen, do you know how important it is to choose your husband wisely? This is the biblical command to submit to your husband. So when you choose who you will date, who you will marry, Keep that in mind. That this is someone you're going to willingly submit to. It takes a lot of people out of the pool, right? So choose wisely. Who are you going to submit to? And then it's as to the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. The submission to the husband is part of your submission to Christ. There's great beauty in that. That you submit to your husband as the Lord, that submitting to your husband is part of you submitting ultimately to your Lord, to Christ himself. And yet, there's such beauty and boundaries that are given here. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And so here's the thing, ladies, look at me, women. You submit to your husband insofar as he is in submission to the Lord. You do not submit when he is telling you to go in opposition to the Lord because the Lord is the Lord. You submit to him in all things, but you submit to your husband as to the Lord. And so this is not just a blanket, just here you go, here's the past gentleman, you get to make your wife do whatever. No, it's in the context of mutual submission, but now this delineation of authority within the husband and wife relationship. The husband is to lead the wife. The husband is to have authority over the wife, but it is as to the Lord. So back in the fear of Christ and as to the Lord create boundaries there that make this a beautiful, functional relationship. So let's keep going with what he says here. Verse 23, because, so here's the reasoning, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. There is much debate about what the word head means here and its original language in Greek. What does head mean here? It can mean, there's basically three large options. It can mean ruler or authority. Um, it could mean source, as in like the head or source of a river flowing out, or it could mean preeminent or to be over. And so we look at context here, and it's kind of un unmistakable that this is referring to ruler or authority, that the husband is the head of the wife, like Christ is the head of the church, as in he is the authority over that. And so context deems it to refer to authority. This is a positional dynamic. And Paul's making a correlation here. Wives, submit to your husbands as the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So you see the correlation. Like the husband is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church. And he brings those two together. So there's a correlation here that he's trying to paint for us. 23b tells us much of what this means and pointing out that this correlation is how Christ is the savior of the body. How is Christ the savior of the body? Through sacrifice, through great cost to himself. And so all the chauvinistic ideas of a wife having to submit to her husband, again, you already have these, these clues that are coming in. It's in the fear of Christ and it's as to the Lord and now as the savior of the body, that's the way that Christ is the head of the church? Does he just come in with a hammer? Or is it the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? Is it the shed blood, the broken body of our Lord that won us over to confess him and his lordship? 
He is the savior of the body. There is protection and care involved in this leadership, this authority that a man has as the head of his wife. It's husbands, you are to protect her. You are to cherish her. You're to provide for her, care for her. And so like the church submits to Christ in everything, wives are to submit to their husbands. And do you see, like consider the benefit that we have in, in when we are submitting to Christ. It should be the same for wives submitting to their husbands. And so to, to that thought, let's look at what comes next. Look at verse 25. There should be a benefit here. So 25, husbands, here you go. You're not off the hook. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. You recall those words from the introduction when Paul says, this is your identity, holy and blameless. 28, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. So husbands, what is this telling us? That love is not based on a variety of emotions, but on an act of conscious will. That the way that you love her is not just how you feel in a moment. It's your conscious decision. It's an act of the will that I will love you. I will love you. And so what should that love look like? So wives submitting to their husbands, husbands loving their wives, what does that love look like? Remember the correlation that Paul is drawing here. Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Christ laid down his life for his bride. And now Paul is saying, Wives, submit to your husbands. But husbands, as she submits to you, this is what it looks like for you. You're going to love her by laying down your life for her. That you're going to cherish her above your own life. You're going to love her like she's your own body because two have become one flesh in Old Testament language. That she is now one with you. Present the church to himself in splendor. Isn't that wild? Every wedding I've ever been to, and I've done quite a few now, the bride takes responsibility primarily for making sure that she is gorgeous on that wedding day. That her aim is to be without spot or blemish. No wrinkles, just dolled up, as beautiful, as breathtaking as possible. My favorite moment of officiating a wedding ceremony is the moment that I always, I'll ask the groom to face me and I'll tell him, you're not allowed to turn until I tell you. And I wait until she's right in the middle of the aisle. Everyone else is already here. So he hears the gasp. He hears people making comments. And I just love to watch the excitement grow in him. And I say, all right, turn around and look at your bride. And to see his face as he turns and he sees her in all of her splendor. But do you know who worked so hard for that? She did. She worked really hard to be as beautiful as possible, to present herself to her groom. But that's not the way that Jesus works. Jesus says, hey, bride, I'm going to make you beautiful. It's going to cost me my life, but I'm going to make you so stunning that I'll present you to myself in splendor. That Jesus takes responsibility for that. And again, go back to our correlation. Husbands, that's how you love your wife. That you own this so much as she submits to you, you lay your life down in love for her to make her beautiful. This is not just physical appearance. In every way, you are laying down your life for her sake to present her to you. When so much of our culture says she's got to do it for herself. But the way of Jesus is he laid down his life in love for her, for us. And so we are to love our wives in the same way. It's natural to love ourselves. And again, he's saying, like, you love her like you love your own body. If you don't love her, that's like not loving your own body. That's, that's silly. That's nonsensical. And so it's natural to love yourself. It ought to be natural to love your wife, to live sacrificially for the sake of your bride. So take care of her, protect her, value her, cherish her. Seek intimacy with her. This is not what Jesus came to do. 
is to actually bring us back to him. We had been estranged because of our sin, our rebellion. You go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, they fall. The curse of the fall comes upon them because of sin, this act of rebellion and disobedience to God. And every one of us knows that we live in the same rebellious state as they did. That in every way, I'll choose to be my own God in so many ways, and I'll fall short of his law, his standard of holiness. I'll rebel against him. We live in sin continually. And we're called to fight that. But as we do that, and we see that what we're trying to do is come back into a relationship with God, that's what we long for. To belong, to know that there's a place where I belong, to be known, to experience real intimacy and still be loved. And this is what the gospel is, that Jesus has done this for us. To say, you were kicked out of Eden. You couldn't be with the tree of life to where you could live forever. Instead, now you live under the curse of death because of your sin. And so you've been taken out and you live in exile. And yet Jesus comes and says, you belong with me. And I know you. He knows us through and through. There's nothing hidden from him. That is real intimacy. And yet with the assurance that he still loves us. How amazing is that? That he knows every bit of us and he still says, I love you and I'm drawn towards you in your sin because I want to save you. I will present you before myself in splendor and glory. I will sanctify you. I will wash you. That he will do that for us is intimacy to be back in a relationship with God, fully known and fully loved. And that is what marriage is. So we're, this is the one relationship where sex is actually celebrated as a beautiful gift to be naked and not be ashamed as they were in the garden. To be with your spouse to where they can know everything and still love you because there's a covenant binding you together. To be in real intimacy. And make that your pursuit. If I can give you a call to action this week, pursue real intimacy with your spouse. But as you pursue real intimacy with your spouse, you've got to see that intimacy, we often think, us guys especially, intimacy is physical. And sex is a beautiful gift from God, but that is not the end. It is just one component of intimacy. And it's a wonderful component, but it's just one component. And so intimacy grows in correlation between what is physical, the sexual, but also the spiritual and the emotional. Just as Jesus came to restore intimacy with us so that we could have an intimate relationship with God, that was physical. He literally had to come. This is what we celebrate at Christmas time, that God took on human flesh, the incarnation. You go to Chipotle, you go to Four Rivers, all you meat eaters, the carne, you know what carne is? It's meat. That God took on meat. He put flesh on. He became like us. It was a physical embodiment. And then he died a physical death. And he physically touched people. He actually went around and healed their physical bodies. And the promise of resurrection is that we will have renewed physical bodies that will be like him. And he came back from the dead and he still ate breakfast. And he still let Thomas touch the scars. Physical is important. But Jesus also came for the spiritual that we are not just our chemistry here. We have more than that. There's this spiritual existence that we live in. There's so much more than just what you see that is physical or the emotional, that he cares about our mental well-being. That Jesus was the master counselor. He's called in Isaiah, prophetically, wonderful counselor. He cares about us in every way. And so in your marriage, if you want greater intimacy and you think, we just have a problem because she won't have enough sex with me, then you probably don't have a problem with physical intimacy. You probably have a problem with emotional intimacy or spiritual intimacy. I talk to couples a lot about this stuff, that often what we think is the problem is not really the problem. It's something else, but they live in such tandem. They're in such great correlation that you have to grow in all aspects. So pursue physical, spiritual, and emotional intimacy with your spouse. This is you loving her, husbands. Pursue that. Take ownership of that. Lay your life down for her. That's how you love her. That you care more about her success than your own. Isn't that wild? This is so countercultural for any of us, regardless of gender. But husbands, your call is to lay your life down for the sake of your wife. That's how you love her. You care about her at that level. And you go back to the original attention. Wives, submit to your husbands. Who doesn't want to submit to someone who loves them like that, 
Who would not want to submit to a husband who is going to lay his life down for your sake? And this is what we do with Jesus. The one who laid his life down for us. We willingly submit and say, you are the Lord. I'll follow you. He is an authority over us. And now look as we continue on in verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, you, your text probably has that in bold or in parentheses or quotation marks, something to indicate this is a quote. Um, this is a quote directly from Genesis 2.24. This is from the Old Testament. This is the institution of marriage. And so kind of seemingly out of nowhere, I mean, we are talking about marriage, but now Paul goes from giving us these charges of husbands and wives, here's how you're to relate to your spouse. Then all of a sudden he throws it back and he pulls in this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This mystery is profound. He has quoted the institution of marriage in the context of talking about marriage relationships. He says, here's the starting point. This is a mystery, and it's profound. What's the mystery? Marriage. What's he talking about? Marriage. So marriage is a mystery, Paul says. Remember our question at the start. What is the point of this? Why do we do this? Is this worth it? What are we doing here? Paul says, this is a profound mystery. But then he discloses the mystery. He says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. What does he mean there? Quoting Genesis 2.24 as the institution of marriage and seeing how this is tied to the prior argument of loving one's wife as oneself, the two becoming one flesh, why does he call marriage a mystery? What is he talking about here? And then saying that it's about Christ and the church. And you consider this, that across all of human history, across the the distance of time and space, every culture, anthropologically, there is some form of marriage institution. There is some form of romantic, exclusive other that is valued, that is prized in the culture. Why is that? And you even think about in today's culture, we listen to different types of music and genres where like rampant player kind of like get as many as you can, the the tender culture of hook up as much as often and all this stuff. Like even in the midst of that, you hear it expressed in lyrics, you hear it expressed and the desires of individuals seeped into that, that they're really looking for the one. Who's gonna be the one? What a paradox, what a mystery that even in people who are celebrating just rampant hypersexualism, just get everything you can, But in the midst of that, looking for the one. Who's going to be the one? And so why is it that marriage across time and place has always been a thing? It's a profound mystery. But he tells us this is why. This is why God wrote it into our very being. It's about Christ and the church. What that means for us is that marriage is actually meant to be a picture of the gospel. That the opportunity that you have in your marriage is to paint a picture of the gospel, that people should look at you, the way that you love your spouse, the way that you submit, the way that you lay your life down, the way that you love, the way that you relate to each other. And they should say, that is wildly compelling. That is amazing. That is like beyond this world. That is like the way that God loves us that it's full of grace. It's full of truth too, but it's full of grace. It's full of sacrifice. It's this love that's not like the junk drawer language that we give to love now. I love Cheetos. And I love my wife. You can't possibly mean the same thing there, can you? But it's to step into, no, here's real love. That I will love you At great expense, I will love you like you're my own body because we've become one. It's to love in such a way that the world would look on and say, what a wonderful picture of the way that God loves us. To see the gospel painted, this picture in marriage. So if you want that to happen, if you want a healthy marriage, that has to be the aim. As secular, spiritual, anyone across the gambit, if you want a healthy marriage, you have got to have a shared vision if you're not aiming for the same thing, if you don't have shared goals, if you don't have a vision of this is where we are headed, then it's not going to go well for you. 
when spouses fall into these just kind of like they've taken up a position against each other and they've locked eyes on just each other and how they can tear each other apart because I'm going here and I'm going here and it's like you're not even going there or there. Right now all you want to do is just destroy each other and you're not going to actually make progress by looking back at here and here. It's when you come to a common place, a common vision, a shared vision, a shared purpose for this that then we can start to move forward. So you've got to let go of some of those things that are dividing you and taking you sideways and say, what do we have together? And believer, this is what you have. That the goal of your marriage, the intention, the profound mystery that has been revealed, the point of this is to make much of God and his glory by showcasing the gospel and the way that you love each other. That it can be a picture of the way that Jesus loves his church, his bride. That's what you get to do with this. And so we've got to make that our aim to have healthy marriages. Can we paint a picture of the gospel in the way that we love each other? And then when you have that shared vision, you have these shared goals, they're essential, then it's going to become more and more beautiful. Talk about those things. Like make a date night this week, even if it's an at-home date night, and just say, where are we headed? I just want to have a conversation with you. There's no real agenda here other than to say, where are we going? Let's paint that picture. Decide it together. And if you are a follower of Jesus, this is what it's about. Making much of him and his glory, showcasing the kind of love that he has for us. Make that your aim. And so Paul starts to wrap this up. Look at verse 33. He literally says, to sum up, to sum up, Each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Like, whoa, he changed the language a little there. Husbands, yeah, love your wife. We we covered all that, but now it's wife, respect your husband. Is that different from submission? Again, that helps us to see what is the heart behind, the meaning behind a wife functionally submitting to her husband in this mutual submission relationship because we're all supposed to be submitting to one another. There's a delineation of authority but it comes back and you think back to the garden and part of the curse, there's going to be enmity between you and your husband. Your desire will be for him, but he'll rule over you. That can be so distorted and create so much pain. But he sums it up here by pulling it back and saying, husbands, love your wife like you love yourself, which is such the language of Jesus. Greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That as much as you love you, you should love them. And he's pulling that into the marriage relationship because now it should be even more so. Two have become one flesh. Love her like you love yourself. Gentlemen, let's admit, generally speaking, love doesn't come easily for us. That's just not our natural bent. Like in a sense it is, but in this, this eros sense, this romantic, erotic sense, it's not as easy. It's, it's, like, it's like learning a second language for us. I'm speaking in generalities. And then wives, respect your husband. Gentlemen, again to you, you know what is a primary language for us? Respect. We walk into a room, we see another guy. You know the head nod code? Come over here. What's up? Check that out. Respect. We, we're always sizing each other up because we live and breathe and speak fluently the language of respect. So you don't need to be told, respect your wife. You, maybe you do. But that's actually a, a fairly natural thing to understand the world of respect. But wives, that's not your primary language. What is your primary language? Love. It's so much more natural, intuitional for you to love in the sense that he's calling husbands to And so it's like he's saying here, as I summarize, the thing that doesn't come naturally for you, husbands, you need to do that. Love her. Lay down your life for her. Wives, the thing that doesn't come as naturally for you, you need to do that. Respect him. And I can, obviously, there's a bias here because I'm a man. But as a husband, wives, I want to tell you, do you have any idea how powerful your words are to us? The way that you talk to your husband, the things that you say to him will build him up or tear him down so quickly. Be careful in the way you talk to him. Respect him. And then husbands, again, 
I don't have the, the authoritative stance to speak as a woman. But from everything that I've learned, primarily scripture, do you know how much she needs to be cherished? She needs to be shown that she is greatly valued. She is so deeply loved, but that must be expressed. You have to show her that. Lay your life down for her. Own her sanctification. Make her beautiful. Because this is the gospel, that Jesus has done that for us. The ultimate groom and we are his bride. The covenant has been stated. It's legally binding. We have been declared righteous. We are justified in the sight of God. We are betrothed to him. And yet the marriage has not yet been consummated. And so we live in the tension of today of like, I so love you, but I don't yet fully experience the intimacy that I crave. And he stands there winking in heaven saying, you just wait. The day is coming. I'm coming back for you. This is what we wait. We wait for this. When he comes to fully consummate the marriage, and this is why the Revelation talks about the end of days being like a wedding feast that we're caught up and we are this bride who's caught up into the air and we're presented to himself. He presents us to himself in splendor and glory. And then a party breaks out. And we go back to communion when Jesus says, the fruit of this vine, I won't drink it again until I drink it again with you anew in the kingdom. That he's looking forward to this just as much as we are. The way that he has laid his life down to secure this, to say, you're mine. And the way that he is working to present us to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle, holy and blameless before him. We get to do that with our spouse, to make our marriages a picture of the gospel, the way that God loves us. What a God he is. So skeptic, seeker, stumbling, or doubting saint, Can you believe this good news? A follower of Jesus, who can you share this good news with? And I want to ask you really quick to actually do that very practically this week. We're going to have a Christmas Eve gathering here. If you're only coming to one gathering this Christmas, we have Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I'm going to ask you to come to Christmas Eve and invite a lot of people so that we can celebrate and share this good news, that there's a God who loves us like this, that the gospel is real, that Jesus has come to save us, to give us life everlasting. Invite people to Christmas Eve. And a practical way you can do this, this is the second one, the last one, this Friday is Light Up Claremont. Thousands of people will be right here downtown, and we have an office right on the street where it's gonna be celebrated. We have a tent reserved for us. We're gonna have a kid's craft, I want all of our church there. I know. If you're like me, you're like, that's an introvert. I don't know, like big crowds. Do it. Flex that muscle. Let it grow. Be there. Let them see the way that we love each other. Let's just have a good time. The office is going to be open. We're going to have hot chocolate. We're going to have a really, really epic, Phil, thank you so much, really epic photo opportunity at the office space. We're going to have music, all kinds of fun stuff down at the tent. We're going to have the crafts, magnets, and things like that. But just be there and love on each other and invite people into that because it doesn't terminate on us. Jesus said the world will know that we follow him by our love for each other. Let them see the way we love each other. But then we turn that in hospitality to the outsider and say, come on in. There's room for you. There's a seat at the table. So will you be there and just be joyful and be willing to invite people in to hear this gospel, share this good news with them? Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your love. Thank you that it looked like you literally dying, laying your life down, Jesus, for our sake as your bride to secure us to make it a legally binding thing that we are yours and you are ours. And God, we long for the day when this is fully consummated. We get to see you face to face. We get to enjoy you for all of eternity without the threat of death or sin or sorrow. All the former things you said, they will have passed away. So just be in bliss with you. Oh, we long for that. But God, we recognize that today it is our responsibility to tell the world that good news, that they can experience that with us too. And so God, would our marriages be a place where that is showcased? Spirit, work in relationships. 
Make us holy. Teach us to love and to respect each other. Thank you that you have shown us what that looks like. And by your power, would you make it so for us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.